before I became a game developer, I was a cognitive psychologist. It's only actually been the last couple years of my career that I've tried to meld the two. So this uh, presentation is an effort to do that. So you can tell me at the end how successful I was. So we're wired as humans. So I'm gonna talk about humans first before I talk about uh, virtual characters. We're wired as humans to read faces and eyes. We're wired to personify things around us. And we're wired to learn and experience the world through our bodies. And yet what we find is not that much technology actually uses those uh, very human qualities of, of us. Now, the picture up here, I happen, it's a very fond one for me. Uh, that's my son and my granddaughter, Louisa, at five days of age. You can't quite see it, but they're staring into each other's eyes. This kind of eye contact, you know, up until the 60s, we didn't know that infants could see this well. Then there was a psychologist named Robert Fance who through a series of ingenious studies showed us that not only did children, infants, not only were they able to detect patterns to see, but they had this big preference for faces, really as infants. And so when you look at that kind of eye contact, you realize, I mean, there's an evolutionary imperative, right? They're developing attachment from child to parent, parent to child, through that kind of facial communication. So it is really a key element to us as humans. Personification is just a fancy word for the fact that, and I'm not saying this is innate at all, I think, however, it is across all cultures and from time immemorial, where we imbue human characteristics to non-human non-humans around us. Obviously animals, it's most common with animals, but you know, I, my favorite book of all time, Watership Down, is a uh, rabbit warren with, imbued with characteristics of people, but also weather patterns, right? Hurricane names, also our technology, Alexa. So this is something that we do frequently and uh, really helps engage us with non-humans. The main point is that we want to attribute mental states to virtual characters. We apply a theory of mind, is what psychologists talk about, so that we're trying to understand what's in the mind and attribute a mind to non-human characters. The final point here on this slide is that we learn through our bodies. The first stage of human development is called sensory motor. So any of you with young children, you may remember how exciting it was two to three months of age where they finally start to reach for things. And what's the first thing they do when they reach for an object? They bring it to their mouth. So the first year of development is called the sensory motor stage where infants develop a theory of the world, how the world works, their understanding of the world through their physical body. And so this is such a key element for us. As adults, we think, oh, it's our mind directs our body. It's, all a, it's, it's a one directional flow, how, how we work. We think about walking and then our legs walk. But in fact, in the last 10 years, neuroscience has shown that it's actually a very much a two-way street, that sometimes our body knows before our conscious mind knows. One of the most ingenious experiments that showed the importance of our body in, in understanding the world is uh, they were doing a card game. I don't remember exactly which one. It was one where it was like I declare war, where the cards are all supposed to be random, except the cards weren't random, they were fixed. They had the people playing all wired up with all types of sensors. And what they discovered was that the, that the person's body became, came to understand that the cards were fixed before it, uh, it arrived at their mental consciousness. Their hands were sweating, their pulse was going up, and then some moments later, oh, these cards are fixed, this isn't random. So this idea, the importance of leading first with our body in our interactions with virtual characters. This is something, that, the point that I wanna make. 
here. So moving on quickly. Evolution of character interactions. The, the main point here is we know that we've gotten much better, right, at visualizing characters. I was at CES last week, and at CES I met a man who represented a Chinese VR company, headset company. He says that they support 8K graphics. Imagine, that looks, that is super real, right? So our ability to visualize these characters is coming along very quickly. Of course, the AI that makes these characters act like real humans, that we have a, <laughs> we're, not, we're not quite as advanced there, nor are we as advanced in terms of more human interfaces, either with touch and with voice, but I'll be talking more about that. I don't know, Lone Echo is such a cool game, I just wanted to bring it up here as an example of a VR game. In this instance, you're the robot, and the person you're trying to help is the human on a space station. So this human on the space station, the virtual character, is lonely, and you're trying to help her not be as lonely, and you're also trying to save her. I think it's a really interesting role reversal, which showed me how it is really possible to build empathy for a virtual character. So that's one of the reasons why I brought it up in this slide. So just as an overview, we're seeing virtual characters now everywhere. Games, education, and the more linear storytelling uh, in the VR movies. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in is education because we've seen that with children, their attention is riveted with these virtual characters. So uh, we've probably all seen those dystopic views of the world where you have AR messages everywhere and you're thinking, oh my God, my attention is being just, uh, it's crazy. But yet what you see, even in that kind of a world, is that our attention does become riveted when there's a human-like character in that space. And I think that that's a really good way. In fact, AR can be used to direct your attention in a very efficient way. So let's talk about some of the different ways that we interact with virtual characters today. I imagine you all remember Talking Tom. Remember how fun that was when this weird little character repeated everything that you said? Well, we've quickly evolved in terms of voice, uh, last week at CES, it was clearly the voice assistant CES show. That's all anybody wanted to talk about, the importance of voice assistants. So we've gone from talking Tom who repeats what you say in a squeaky little voice to you know, dialogue boxes, which are more canned but give the sense of a little more open-endedness to uh, Alexa and Google Home where you're actually opening up all the information on the internet. We're still not there in a lot of back and forth kinds of dialogue, but we're certainly making, we're certainly starting to use voice in a way that makes the interactions with the character feel more normal, more natural. One thing that I think is really key to all of this is personalization that comes along with uh, AI combined with voice. So for example, I was, I was thinking about an example of this uh, I, I was in a, our company sells products at Walmart. I was walking into a Walmart store and they still have Walmart greeters at some of these stores. So you have this nice chubby little lady, old lady who stands at the front of the Walmart and says, welcome, what, would you, what are you looking for? Can I help you? And I'm thinking, what would it be like to put her as, create a virtual character based on that Walmart greeter? And not only she has face recognition, which a number of stores now use their security cameras to capture faces and to recognize customers who are regulars. So what if she had face recognition? She knew who I was when I walked in the door and she said, hi, Ariella, welcome back. Last time you were here, you bought some hairspray and we have hairspray on sale this, you know, today on aisle four, go check it out. I mean, it sounds a little weird and scary, but that is certainly, that, that actually, that technology is actually there already for her to be able to do that. And that's the way I think the personalization, we know from marketing research 
that if you personalize somebody's AT&T phone bill just with their name, you know, the response rate goes up by 25%. So personalization combined in these virtual characters with voice is gonna be a very powerful. And then eyes, as I've talked about before, having eyes that actually that virtual character looking at you and following you as you move around, absolutely key. In the early days, they used to put sunglasses on our virtual characters because they knew they couldn't do eye tracking well, so the animators just stop trying, basically. But eye tracking is really key, and being able to read facial expressions, especially reading emotion, uh, that becomes very important in the kinds of virtual characters that we need to uh, create. So now I can talk a little bit about a game I've been involved with called Color Blaster. Um, that's the first game up there in the corner, and actually you can vote for us. We're, uh, we're one of the indie games that's here today. This is a walk-around AR game, and so in this game, the virtual character's following you. And it's cool because it, with other types of walk-around games, you're, you're spawning the virtual world around the child. So the child can go into the elevator, into the bathroom, down the hall, it doesn't matter. The zombies follow, the plants and trees and everything else get spawned around them. Now we've learned a couple things about these games where characters follow you. The first thing, and some of them are self-evident, right? You don't want the character, you want them close. Proximal is good, distal is not good. They don't pay attention to things too far away, but you don't want them too close either, because that's weird. So you have to figure out what that comfortable space is. Another thing we learned was that, you know, the, the character obviously knows where I am. I'm holding the phone, right? This, this game is on, was on Tango, Google Tango, uh, AR Kit, and will soon be on AR Core. So obviously the, kid, the, the virtual character knows where I am. Rather than have that virtual character make a beeline for me, which is the way we originally designed it, it feels much more natural if that virtual character goes in and out of your environment and not, and not just straight for you. So those are some of the things that we learned that some movement tricks that make the experience feel more real. Very important touch, as I talked about before, and using your body. L.A. Noir, which the VR version, I don't know if you've actually played with that one yet, but it has motion controls and actually has a really good use of arms and hands. So you use your arms to walk, you use your hands to steer a car, and my favorite use of hands is in the fighting where, and I, you know, I don't actually, there are probably other VR games that do this, but I'm not aware of them, where you can throw a punch and the virtual character will react to you and they throw a punch, you react to them. So it's that beginning of reading body language, which we do such a terrible job of, you know, in games. So it's the beginning of being aware of how they're moving their body and then reacting to that. So I think that's a pretty cool use of body. Uh, and then finally, other characters. One of the things I wanted to do with our zombie game, but we never got in, in was having the virtual characters react to each other. So Google Stickers, which is you know, hugely popular. So this particular picture is with Stranger Things. So if you put certain characters together, here it's Eleven and Demogorgon, they'll fight. The same thing with the Star Wars Google Stickers certain characters, you put them together and they'll interact. So that's kind of a cool idea, right? And all of this helps make these virtual characters feel more real, more relevant. And then finally, types of interactions related to the environment. We know from Pokemon Go that having a relevant character in a specific location makes all the difference about how we actually view that character. So having a Starbucks barista virtual character outside of the Starbucks store, who then will take your order before you walk into the store, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that today. 
and that character feels like it belongs in front of the Starbucks store. The world sensing part of this is probably the most interesting to me as a developer. We have, ARKit and ARCore have lots of issues with objects in the environment and the fact that characters today don't know that those objects exist. And not only don't we know that the table is there, but they don't know what the table is used for. Now, it's, it's true that we can uh, have a general notion that there's something there, but it's not a sophisticated notion so that they're gonna actually walk around it, not with ARKit or ARCore today. But what we have seen, HoloLens, for example, which has much more world sensing capabilities in its AR, more sophisticated, not only knows, if you look at that first picture, you'll see those virtual characters, see the virtual characters standing against the wall. They know the wall is there. They're leaning against the wall. Or the virtual character who's sitting on a chair. So interacting in a realistic way with objects that are in the room, knowing how to use those objects, that makes a big difference in how we perceive those virtual characters. The, all the big companies obviously are working on this giant database. You know, I don't know if anybody has a Pixel phone and has used Google Lens. Very cool notion of crowdsourcing this object database. But once we have that, then our virtual characters can interact with the world in a very realistic way. And then finally, there are other things in the world that our characters, we want our characters to interact with. And in fact, in the latest version of Pokemon Go, they do take into consideration time and weather. This is a Color Blaster. Oh, Thank goodness you're here. We need you. Something is stealing color from the world. That zombie lost all their color, and now they want yours. Give them color to make them happy. Don't let them get too close. They're after your colors. They're trying to get my color. You've made him so happy he's dancing. Oh. So this is an example of a walk around game, a physical action game. You know, we're gonna have hide and go seek, musical chairs, tag, all these classic games that we'll be able to play with virtual characters. Uh, anybody who's involved in this space understands that without AR Cloud being up and running and Google's working on this very, as, as well as 10 other companies, Amazon and everybody else, until we, have a cloud solution, it's gonna be really hard to do good, solid multiplayer versions of these action games. But when that happens, hopefully later this year, there'll be some good solutions out there. Then we're gonna see a lot more traditional active games. The other uh, games I was going to show you, Very Hungry Caterpillar, absolutely charming AR kit game that has to do with exploration, which is a really good play pattern for younger kids, especially under six. And then a tabletop board game, that one is a hollow grid, and I think they're up for an indie prize as well. Uh, again, you have two, char two uh, virtual characters playing together a version of sort of chess with role playing game, and they interact then depending on where you place the characters. Very cool product. Last screen, I wanted to talk just a little bit about our visualization of these uh, virtual characters. If you notice, this is called the uncanny valley. This is a theoretical formulation that's not been proven, but there are a lot of artists, graphic artists, who believe in this very much. The uncanny valley refers to, you see the lowest point in that graph, and it's the lowest point right before it's a, a piece of art is entirely believable. So at that low point, the 
character looks almost real, but not quite. And that's what gives us this feeling of weirdness and eeriness about the character. So there are plenty, I mean, Hollywood has grappled with this, right? How do we, what, what's our graphic style here of, a, of an artificial character in her or in Ex Machina, right? And her, remember, it was just a voice. I think they just tried not to you know, visualize it. It was too difficult. So it was Scarlett Johansson's beautiful, sexy, sultry voice, but no visualization of her. In Ex Machina, it was a actress who looked like a real actress, and they did weird stuff with her body to make sure you knew that she was artificial. So the, the issue then is, do you, in today's world, since we can't make them behave, both with their facial expressions, their body movements, like a real person, do we ratchet down then the way we visualize them to try to match it? Or do we go with the mismatch between this uber realistic looking character, but who doesn't actually behave entirely human? Because the AI has, is not at the same level as our ability to draw and create these characters. So that's something that we have to think about, You're the, the way in which you visualize these characters will matter and people have very different reactions to them, for sure. So just in summary, I think we're some years away from realistic re interactions with believable virtual characters. But with AR and VR, we're taking some small but really important steps with more physical verisimilitude than we've ever had before, eye tracking, uh, and facial expressiveness with use of more natural interfaces with both our bodies as well as our voice and realistic interactions with the environment. And together this is becoming, this, this means that now we should really start seriously thinking how to use interactive virtual characters in our games both with kids and beyond. Thank you. Possible that we have uh, time for one question? Yeah. Quick question though, with the Crayola, were you guys able to integrate any of the Crayola products? For example, if a kid scanned a pink toy, then, then they could use the color pink in the battle game? Uh, so your question was, were we able to integrate any actual physical product, physical product mm -hmm. into the game? Right, for the colors, that type of thing. Yes, uh, so the original version that we did of this game was called Crayola Color Blaster. It was on Google Tango. Actually, we were really fortunate. Google uh, paid us to develop that game. We were part of a contest, and we won the contest. Um, and in that game on Tango, we did not use any physical device. Now, uh, I have to say, and I don't know if there's somebody here from, uh, is, is it uh, Verge? Uh, what is the, hmm, I think that's the name of the company. The company that has the cube, do you know which company I'm talking about? Uh, the AR cube. They had, they just announced that company, I think it's Verge VR, they just announced a gun that can be used. It's all uh, soft uh, foam, gun, uh, soft foam gun that can be used in an AR game. And one of the things that I think about, not because I don't know exactly how we would, with our gameplay, use a um, paintbrush. That's actually an interesting idea, though. But with that gun, I was thinking, oh, we could, because it's really you're, you're throwing paint, essentially, at these virtual characters. You're throwing paint. So it could become, you know, there, there are opportunities, I think, with the right peripheral to bring it into the gameplay. We haven't done it yet, though. Yes? Merge. Merge, thank you. Yes, so they're, they're specializing in these types of AR peripherals. So yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. Haven't, haven't done anything in that area yet. But how much more fun that would be if you had something in your hand, whether it's a paintbrush or 
you know. Okay, thank you.